Hi everyone, um, welcome to the High Energy Seminar. Um, today both of our speakers are uh, uh, visiting us from Caltech. So we are going to follow the tradition of this seminar to let them introduce each other. Uh, so, well, welcome to the, uh, the seminar. This is my pleasure to introduce today uh, Lena Murchiko from Caltech. Uh, basically, uh, Elena did her undergrad studies at the Moscow State University, uh, where she specialized in elementary particle physics, and then she moved to London, where she worked for three years as a string theorist, and basically she was dealing with uh, kind of, uh, you know, scales of like 10 to the minus 35 meters, but at some point she decided it was like kind of too small, so she wanted to go big. So then she wanted for a PhD at Caltech, studying the areas around Sagittarius A star was kind of 10 to the 14 meters, so that was kind of slightly a bigger size, right? So even though she uh, also has her feet on the ground, like sometimes you can find her like somewhere flying in between the clouds, and this is because basically she's a licensed uh, pilot, and she's also like in the board director of the Caltech Flying Club. So uh, please, <laughs> You're embarrassed. <laughs> you are much. As we're in tradition. One another. I'll remember that one. <laughs> um, yes, I'll be. Th uh, thank you very much for inviting. Oh. Uh, one to three. Can you hear me? One to three. Uh, thank you very much for inviting. It's really a pleasure to speak here. Thank you very much for coming. I'll talk to you today um, about the first discovery of a uh, warm accretion disk around Sagittarius A star. Uh, before I go to my topic, I will also mention that I'll, my talk will be mainly uh, observational. Uh, I actually more a theoretical physicist rather than observational astronomer. Uh, so anyone who wants to talk about uh, numerical simulations of uh, uh, super... Uh, neutrino transport and supernovas, or topics on the boundary between nuclear physics and uh, astrophysics can also talk to me. Um, uh, let me take you now to the galactic center. So, as you all know, galactic center is located about 8 kiloparsecs away from us, in the direction mostly visible from the southern hemisphere. Uh, in the constellation of Sagittarius, from where it takes its name, uh, covered by the dust, uh, thick dust clouds, just to the side from the mini spiral, you'll see it right here. This is our own galactic center black hole. Uh, here is a schematic plot of the galactic center. Uh, you see the mass of the black hole is 4, 10 to the 6 uh, solar masses, uh, which is quite small uh, by the standards of supermassive black holes. Uh, you see it's surrounded by the nuclear star cluster about one parsec away. Uh, Keplerian fallout velocity from which uh, the gravity of the black hole itself starts dominating the rotation of the stars rather than effective uh, mass of the star cluster plus the black hole is 0.3 parsecs. Uh, the free lines, which is the mini spirals, are, it's not actually a mini spiral, it's the free streams of the gas going to the galactic center. And the scales we'll be talking about is this little dot right here. It is uh, 0 0.004 parsecs. Uh, I also want to mention that also galactic center is not very big black hole. It's not very active, but it's the closest one to us. Therefore, it's our best chance, our key to study uh, physics near the event horizon, black hole build up, black hole immediate environments. Uh, also, uh, wait a second. A galactic center black hole is a very important black hole. That's, um, there are many models describing accretion onto it. But the only thing we actually know with certainty is that accretion is very small. Small compared uh, to what if we simply divide the mass of the black hole by the lifetime of the galaxy, we'll get 10 to the minus 4 solar masses a year. 
I'm not trying to claim that's how accretion is supposed to go. I'm just comparing it with this number. So currently, accretion rate of Sagittarius is about uh, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 2 <coughs> or, uh, times smaller than that. Our, the main source of our information about the galactic centers are X-rays. However, X-rays can only probe a very hot gas, the gas at the temperature is about 10 to the 7 kelvins. Uh, but if we have hot gas, hot gas tends to cool. And it cools very, very efficiently up to the temperature is about 10 to the 4 kelvins, after which uh, cooling substantially slows down. So it is uh, fair to assume that possibly there is a creation reservoir of Sagittarius, which is, uh, consists of the warm, warm gas rather than hot. The gas at the temperature is about 10 to the 4 kelvins. Uh, this gas obviously is invisible in X-rays, but we can probe this gas, and I'll be talking about how to probe this gas in recombination lines of hydrogen. Uh, so the, the experiments I'll, I'm talking about is uh, ALMA observation of uh, recombination line of hydrogen from the galactic center region. Um, I'm the PI of three ALMA proposals, and with... Uh, and I mainly will be talking about the cycle 3 proposal. I'll also mention cycle 4 because it uh, arrived just before I went to the East Coast to give talks. And cycle 5 hasn't happened yet. It's going to be uh, taken around April. Uh, my, I'm really grateful to my co eyes who are Nick Scoville, Jim Koda, Jurgen Ott, and uh, cycle 5 was heavily... Uh, with Roger Blanford. Uh, so, before I go into explaining the details of the experiment, uh, I just want to <coughs> give you a brief glimpse of what I'm, where I'm driving to. I will show you that there is, um, I will show you the detection of uh, hydrogen recombination line from the galactic center, from the region around the galactic center black hole. Uh, it is wide, about two thousand kilometers per second wide line and uh, it comes from the region of 0 0.008 parsecs radius around the black hole and it applies the mass of the disk around a few <coughs> Jupiter masses. So uh, I'm sorry to bore you with the slide if you're very familiar with it but I'll still briefly go through how the recombination light technique works. Uh, so if we have uh, sources of ionizing radiation and we have n neutron hydrogen, and we have photons with energy higher than 13.6, those photons can ionize hydrogen, converting it to protons and electrons. Uh, being present in the same volume, protons and electrons tend to recombine. Most of the recombination goes to N1 of hydrogen. But some of them, much fewer no in numbers, can go to higher level of n. So if they combine to high n level, then the electron then cascades down, uh, going to st statisti doing jumps very st statistically through certain levels. Sometimes during those cascades, the electron can pass between the levels we are interested in. And we'll be talking about levels transition from N31 to N30, uh, hydrogen H30 alpha. I will explain why this uh, particular line was taken. Uh, only one in 5,000, about one in 5,000 transition goes through this line. Uh, but the big advantage of this technique is that every single process here uh, can be computed quantum mechanically with uh, any precision you want to. So knowing the flux in the recombination line, we would know how many transitions happening, how many uh, electrons are recombining, and eventually how many ionizing <coughs> photons are there and how much material is there. Uh, what I was saying is good for any recombination line of non-forbidden transition without inverse population. But there is a big advantage of hydrogen uh, submillimeter recombination line because a sub-millimeter line goes through the dust without absorption. So we don't have to, almost without absorption. So we don't have to assume 
uh, that we know exactly what happened between us and the uh, galactic center. Also, the advantage of hydrogen recombination line is that we know that most of material is hydrogen. And also, we know the presence of other ions uh, with high accuracy in the solar neighborhood. We cannot say it about the galactic center. So if we use other ions, uh, the result will be subject to correction. Those corrections can be factors. And there are also practical things factoring in, such as um, your lines, your submillimeter hydrogen line need to fit into the telescope band, not to be too, full, too close to the edge of the band, and be away from strong molecular lines. So because of that, H30 alpha was chosen. There is a one more other option, which was free from uh, molecular lines. But we tried that one, and that one was clean. So we didn't try to look for a second one. Because it would be hard to uh, convince Alma to spend 10 hours of time looking for the line which might not end up being clean. Uh, in general, observations of uh, high end recombination line are very easy. This is an uh, example. It's not Sagittarius A star. It's H2 region, two-thirds of the way to galactic center. Like, not the same direction, but at 5.5 kiloparsecs rather than 8 kiloparsecs. Um, and uh, what you see is the continuum. And you see the continuum subtracted image. So here is the line. And line is very strong. Like, if I look at the peak of the line and compare it to the amount of the continuum, uh, line to continuum is two and a half, which is very, you can get uh, this in nine minutes in Alma. Uh, this is not an image, it's uh, higher precision. It's about two hours on Alma, but because we wanted to get helium 30 alpha and a good limit on helium plus 48 alpha. But you can get uh, H30 in nine minutes beautifully. So how, how is it in the galactic center? In the galactic center, the situation is uh, way more complicated. So the problem is uh, Sagittarius is a source of, uh, continues from Sagittarius, comes mainly from synchrotron. And the source is very strong. It's various, uh, it can be two Jansky, it can be five Jansky, it's few Jansky source. And what we are looking at is for line which is few millijensky, wide and very uh, weak line on top of very, very strong continuum. So this uh, image on the, on the left is continuum. Uh, here is three and a half jensky. And this is continuum subtracted image. Uh, you see the traces of mini spiral and the background image is um, like the, to the scale, how mini spiral is supposed to look. It's just a uh, very high resolution image, so the mini spiral is resolved out, basically, almost completely. Um, uh, before I show you the spectra, I also want to point out that uh, there is a, sometimes there is a misconception that Alma analyzes your data for you. So Alma doesn't do it. So this experiment also uh, it's very complicated, not only because it uses ALMA the moment it went to the full science, like the best interferometer we have, uh, but also because the line is so wide it doesn't fit the spectral <coughs> windows. So the, um, I thought I'll stop just briefly talking about um, what you're supposed to do to get the spectra I'll show you. So because lime is very wide, so here is the ALMA set up for this particular experiment. Uh, you can have two spectral windows on one side, two spectral windows on the other side. So your line is too wide. And the thing is, ALMA calibrates spectral windows separately. Meaning spectral windows will not supposed to really align, since sometimes they don't align. <laughs> and they don't align for like very, very small fraction, maybe like 0.1%. But what we are looking at, we are pushing the limit of ALMA meaning 0.1% is not good enough. So what you, but continuum is so strong, so you cannot just image with continuum. You're supposed to subtract continuum. So what you're actually doing, here's a, a standard procedure is on the left. The procedure I'm talking one is on the right. 
So you have uh, red and blue are two different spectral windows. So here is your line, and you put uh, make a spectral set up in such a way that two spectral windows, they cross each other. So you have enough channels, um, so they cross. Then you need to do continuum subtraction, but very likely, you, I mean, you don't have channels which are pure continuum. You have to continuum subtract through the line. And you continue subtract through the lines separately for different spectral windows. At the end, you obviously distort your spectra. If you try then just say merge, you will lose the line. Uh, so what you need to do, you image, and then you realign uh, the spectra back in the position how it's supposed to be using those channels which are overlapping. Uh, here is the spectra. It comes from the region uh, uh, once about 1,500 AU around Sagittarius. So continuum is free, and I have Jansky. And line to continuum ratio is less than uh, 1 to 1,000. Uh, you see, the line is a double peak. Double peak wide, uh, plus minus 1,000 kilometers per second. Um, the radius, as I say, is about 0 0.008 parsecs, and at this radius, Keplerian rotation is about 1,400, making it being tilted to the line of sight about 45 degrees. Um, as I mentioned, if you calculate the integral under the line, uh, you can infer how much uh, material is there. And the integral under the line is proportional to density square multiplied by volume. So they, um, it's very, uh, the mass of the disk will be the function of the geometry. And I don't have enough data to, at the moment to say what geometry is. So if the disk is thin, and I'll define thin as 1% uh, of the radius, then the, the mass of the disk is going to be 0.8 uh, Jupiter masses. And the density about 10 to the 6. If the disk is thick, and I'll define thick uh, as 60 degrees opening, I mean as much uh, thick as you still call it a disk, uh, 60 degrees, in this case, must go into be 6 Jupiter masses and the density about 10 to the 5. Um, so how did the disk go there? So there might be... Uh, it's still work in progress, but two simplest, simplest things you can say. Maybe it's the cooling of the colliding winds. So for this, uh, I use this uh, comparison of the simulation by Russell 1 and uh, Quadra, uh, where they simulated uh, 12 arc seconds around the galactic center. So what they did, they started with the orbits of the stars thousand years ago um, in empty region, like nothing, only stars. And the stars shed winds. So they don't have mini spiral, and they don't have a feedback from uh, the galactic center, from Sagittarius. Um, and they evolved the system for thousand years. Uh, yes, for thousand years. And at the end, they ended up with um, uh, 10 to the minus, a uh, few 10 to the minus 6 of the warm gas. So w the purpose of the simulation was to produce the image uh, comparable to the Chandra observations. So meaning it, that because the cool uh, warm gas is going to kind of accum accumulate, so within a um, thousand years, you should get few Jupiter masses of the warm gas around there. This is one scenario. A second possible scenario is the tidal disruptions. And um, uh, Nadia will be Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, and Nadia will be talking about tidal disruption later. But just a brief order of magnitude estimations that if tidal disruption ha happened every 10 to the minus 4 years, and it leaves uh, around Sagittarius about 10 to the minus 3, solar masses of the gas then, uh, you know, to keep the disk alive. And uh, the accretion rate will be about 10 to the minus 7. 
And I swear to you, I didn't try to make this number work because I really don't like this scenario. Because it's uh, much harder to explain the disk because the tidal disruption is going to happen from different directions. So I'll be really upset with this one. Um, so I just showed you squiggly line and said that you kind of supposed to believe it. So do you really supposed to believe me? Well, I'll show you a preliminary result from the cycle four observations. Uh, it's preliminary because um, uh, I was doing a job tour instead of analyzing it. Um, the scales are different. So the bottom one go from minus 2,000 to 1,500 and the upper one from uh, minus 2,000 to 3,000. But you see the structure is the same. And um, you see you have st the upper one is noisy and it's supposed to be noisy. <coughs> um, it's totally different spectral setup, but you still see the double peak profile. But you can also notice that the uh, right side is bigger. And the right side is bigger by about 20%. I mean, the total integral on the line is going to be big for about 20%. So one option for that would be that, you know, the disk is clumpy. Uh, the time between those observations is about one year. And uh, if the period of an orbit is ar around four years, it's just enough to rotate 90 degrees. But the second option is that... Uh, What's different between those two observations also is that S2 star is approaching the galactic center. And this S2 star, should they be any neutral hydrogen, will be illuminating it because S2 star is 200 times brighter than Sagittarius <laughs> itself in ionizing radiation. And uh, S2 moved just twice closer to the galactic center. So perhaps this growth is due to the fact that S2 approaching from that side. Um, because I mentioned S2 star, I'll skip through this because um, I will actually, the cycle five observations are actually the observation of the approach of S2 star. Uh, they were proposed before there was a line. So the proposal was just to make, put a constraint on the amount of um, neutral hydrogen. I mean, uh, you do one observation before the passage, few months before, and one observation as close to the passage as possible, because the recombination time is going to be a few months, but you still try to get as much um, ionized stuff as possible. Um, so if there is no difference between those two, fine. We just constrain that there is no neutral hydrogen. But if there is a difference, we can see if there is a neutral hydrogen um, in this region. <coughs> so it's also a different experiments from the previous two, uh, because it's two seven-hour scans, continuum scans. Those scans cover 2,000 kilometers, sorry, 20,000 kilometers per second wide, rather than few 1,500 kilometer per second wide. So those things will actually help to, uh, first of all, hopefully we won't have to realign the channels. Cool, I'm almost done. Second, that uh, because the sky is very wide, in the previous one, you cannot actually see the wings of the line. So for this one, it will be able to say, um, to kind of get you closer to the black hole. Uh, because the stuff closer to the black hole rotates faster, so it's going to be on the outside of the line. And to pick this up, you really need a wider scan. And S2 will pass us at the radius uh, 120 AU, at which the Keplerian velocity is about 5,000 kilometers per second. So there is also lots of things to do with it, because as I say, first of all, the disk rotates on a scale of so few years. You can actually see how it rotates. So few observations will give you the properties of a disk, like clumpy, thin, <coughs> thick. You can actually see it. Moreover, ALMA can go 10 times the resolution I showed you in extended configuration. And um, extended configuration is incredibly hard to get because um, it goes to the extended configuration for a month or two months a year. And it's highly oversubscribed. But if you can resolve the disk around the galactic center, so now I, I can actually propose for the 
observation standard configuration. There is lots of questions about origin of the disk, stability of the disk, like where it's come from, because many people will tell it's not even supposed to be there. And uh, yes, and the other things, cool things you can do with it is to try to figure out the magnetic fields around in this intermediate region, which is uh, very, very f much further than the Schwarzschild radius, but closer than Bondi radius. You can, if you see the Z, try to see the z man splitting on top of the uh, recombination line. And uh, I'm run out of time, and I'll show this just because not, no talk ever goes about black holes ever goes without showing this black hole. Uh, so this is an interstellar black hole with redshift added, so it's not as beautiful as on the movie. And thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, comments? No, I wouldn't expect linear signal. I was just thinking about that we can try to see different polarization structure. If we see a structure, we can infer something, but before we see something, it's very hard to say. <laughs> so like we'll try to split the signal we already have, and because ALMA does by default on two polarizations. So you can split and see if, like, if it is feasible. Yes. Uh, so, because we actually don't know what's magnetic fields in this region, uh, you, if you don't see the amount of splitting, you'll be able to constrain the observation. So this is a, requires pretty strong fields to make it, um, it's take like a gauss to make it uh, wider than a channel. Uh, but, um, you know, it's a thing you can think about. All right, no more questions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and while Nadia is setting up, um, uh, let me introduce Nadezhda Blagorodnova. She is a postdoc at Caltech. Uh, Nadezhda Oh, let not, let not her Russian name fool you. She's actually Spanish. Uh, she grew up in Barcelona, which makes her completely Spanish. And she has a Spanish accent, so that's... Uh, uh, Nadia has a very interesting career because she actually did her undergrad in uh, computer science. And then she worked as a software engineer for Gaia. And while doing it, she got fascinated by the science guy doing. And she went back to school and did her master in uh, ast astronomy, astrophysics? Astronomy? Yeah, well, it's all together. Oh, well, anyway, in, in astrophysics. And then she went to do a PhD in Cambridge University. Well, when you don't, um, she works on a wide range of disciplines from Gaia to red supernovas, tidal disruption events. Um, and when she's not doing her science, she is the president of the Salsa Club at Caltech. <laughs> and not only president, she is also head of teacher of the Salsa Club at Caltech. So, without stealing more of her time, Nadezhda. Well, thank you, Lena, uh, for this great introduction. Um, so yeah, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, tidal disruption events. So like from our galactic core, we are slightly going like just few megaparsecs away and try to catch the UV spectroscopy of this tidal disruption event discovered by the Intermediate Palomar Transient Survey, which is called like uh, IBTF 15 AF. So this event, as, as its name says, it's, it was hanging around for, for a bit. So after like this um, a conference this summer about 
about like aging and accretion, we realized that this event is actually very, very cool. So it really should uh, be published. So uh, I see like there are like a few experts on tidal disruption events in the audience, but however, uh, for the non-experts on TDEs, I would like to remind what a tidal disruption is. And basically, a tidal disruption happens when a very unfortunate star gets scattered either by another uh, star cluster or by a molecular cloud towards the trajectory or to, towards the supermassive black hole, which is like uh, very uh, silently sitting in the core of, the, of its own host galaxy. And basically, when the star approaches closer than the tidal disruption radius, basically the self-gravity of the stars stop acting and the, tars, the, the star starts to be disrupted and shedded apart and some of the material can get accreted. So it's important to notice that actually there is a Schwarzschild radius of the black hole and actually if the star approaches too close to the black hole, it's actually it's going to be swallowed and we would not observe the flare. So if we consider a star which is kind of a normal fiducial star of a solar, you know, solar radii, solar mass, we uh, should remember that the mass of the supermassive black hole, in order for us to be able to see the flare, should be lower than 10 to the 8 solar masses. I mean, there are a few uh, kind of tricks you can play. You can say that the black hole uh, is actually rotating, so this will allow to kind of a closer disruption. Or you may say that if the star is actually not a solar type star, it's not a main sequence star, but it's rather a giant, it's, it's envelope is, is going to be more loosely bound, so actually we can strip part of the gas from the envelope of the star and actually accrete into like a more massive black hole. Um, but yeah, the final parameter I want to mention is that the pericenter radius, and this is kind of the, the closer distance of the, it's like the ratio between the tidal disruption radius and the pericenter. And this is the impact parameter which can also influence on the shape of, of the uh, light curve that we actually see from the tidal disruption events. So um, why, why do we care, right? Like, well, I'm a, a, an observational astronomer doing transients, so I'm really fascinated by uh, tidal disruption events, but why uh, we should in general care about them. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, um, black holes are very black, so there is not much radiation coming from them, and then unless there is something lightening up the core. So actually by having tidal disruption events in otherwise quiescent galaxies, what we can study is like the, the population of masses populating these uh, this course of the galaxies, so we can actually derive a mass function for the supermassive black holes, and also we can study the, uh, the fraction of galaxies will actually host uh, supermassive black holes in, the, in their core, so it's the occupation fraction. But not only that, uh, when we have a, a star which is kind of accreted, we can uh, study the, the formation in situ of accretion disk, like let's say, or in real time during our uh, lifetime, you know, and we can also study the formation of jets around supermassive black holes. And finally, uh, also observations, uh, for example, such as uh the one that, that Lena does, or for example radio, this can allow us to study the densities which are surrounding very, very close distances to the supermassive black holes, or the existence of dust that can be lightened up by the flare in, this, in these galaxies. And finally, the rates of TDs, when we have like enough numbers, we, we can also use them to study the dynamics uh, of the stars very close to supermassive black holes. So going back to a bit of history, the, the first suggestion that actually a star could be possibly disrupted uh, happened in like 1975, and it was not about like a, a decade later that actually uh, people started computing a few models, and they were saying that, well, if the star would be approaching, sort of like um, assuming it was disrupted at the, at the tidal disruption radius, like sort of half of material would be ejected and would be unbound and like the other half would be kind of accreted and it would be returned towards the supermassive black hole with a rate proportional to the t to the minus five thirds. So uh, that was people tried to observe uh, like observationally this t to the minus third is sort of like uh, the smoking gun uh, so far for the um, um, identification of uh, tidal disruption events. So no wonder if we think that the star should be accreted a very close distance to the supermassive black hole. So actually people uh, started uh, searching for this event in X-ray because the gas should be really hot. Uh, and that's uh, what people found. They, they used uh, some archival searches in Rosad and XMM Newton. And actually they found like five candidates in each search uh, for uh, possible tidal disruption event candidates. But then uh, other wavelengths started to appear and actually uh, Suvi Gazari, she also did a search in ultraviolet wavelengths and CFHT optical data. And she also found one candidate, which was one of the first, then she found a bit more. But then uh, in 2011, we had one of these magnificent 
extremely relativistic tidal disruption event, which actually was observed in gamma ray and had extremely strong uh, radio emission as well. Uh, so this, uh, this one event is very remarkable and it's, uh, we did not observe too many like, like that one. But um, yeah, it was extremely radio bright. So it's, I think it's still being observed by follow up by some people. Uh, but then, like, uh, shortly after, people also started to wonder whether these events would be visible in the optical as well. So, uh, short in 2011, he actually used Stribe 82 data from SDSS to look for extremely blue flares in the cores of uh, otherwise quiescent galaxies, which did not show any activity so far. And he found also two candidates. And just one year after, uh, this was a sensational paper, which actually found sort of the, the most representative TD candidate in, in Panstar's data, which I will show later on. And as the uh, last wavelength we had sort of to cover, you know, um, it's uh, infrared and basically uh, one echo was uh, detected from one of these uh, tidal disruption flares also in WISE data, showing that actually there was like more hidden radiation which was like later on uh, reprocessed by sort of lightening up the dust which was surrounding the core. So, as I promised, I'm going to go to this poster child which was observed in the optical and as you can see, there are like a few uh, important characteristics for this event. Here you see the light curve, and basically uh, it was a really bright event. So it's like a minus 20 uh, magnitudes in, in the G-band. Uh, if you work in the optical, and basically it was coincident with the center of otherwise uh, quiescent galaxy. It was not an AGN, it did not have any activity in the past, it was like just uh, like a very quiet galaxy. And out of a sudden, this uh, very bright flare occurred in the optical and UV wavelengths, and it had really blue and constant colors over the whole uh, nearly two years of the follow-up of this object. Generally supernovae, they expand, they cool, so the colors becoming extremely red. But for this event, it just stayed the same uh, temperature all the way down, which was like pretty amazing. And they took a couple of spectrum, and uh, this actually marked the beginning of an uh, optical uh, TD hunt in optical wavelengths. And basically people detected, when they subtracted the host galaxy, they detected these two very remarkable helium-2 lines, which actually were initially attributed that the star which was, get, uh, which was disrupted were actually a very, very helium-rich, and it was hydrogen depleted. So as I mentioned, this started to be like the, the beginning of the hunt for TDs, and a few more came just after. And also people were like really, really hunting for these helium-2 lines. But then it started to be a bit uh, uncomfortable situation because like quite a few of these guys actually show very prominent helium-2 lines. And some of them even not showed any hydrogen at all, what uh, people would, would rather expect. So um, several models started to uh, come to explain why uh, most of these uh, TDs actually had these very, very prominent helium-2 lines and maybe no, no hydrogen. So one of the uh, initial models was actually proposed by um, James Guillaume here in house. Um, and well, basically was, what he was proposing is like the emission lines were not like photoionization of these unbound debris that I mentioned, but rather it was coming from this uh, broad light region, sort of these cloudlets which are uh, forming above and below sort of the, this accretion disk. And basically the lines were forming at, the, at a different radii from a, a supermassive black hole. So basically if the disk was not expanded enough to actually be cold enough to create these lines, they would not appear in the spectrum. And this same idea was picked up by uh, Nathan Roth, who actually used the uh, simulation relative transfer simulation so to actually model this as a kind of layered uh, atmospheres, which would rather uh, be similar to like a stellar atmosphere rather than an optically thin gas. And basically uh, what he created is like kind of these soft x-rays in the middle which were reprocessed by the other layers for, for this event. So actually the, the last was like the electron scatter lake which kind of created the, this Laurentian profile for these lines. And by using this model, actually, he could uh, sort of explain why some of this hydrogen was missing from these TDs and why we were not seeing this X-ray from this very hot accretion disk very close to the supermassive black hole, and also why we could see this sort of uh, much larger radii for, for the emission uh, than we would expect otherwise. 
And, but however, there is uh, also like a competing model. And uh, this, this model proposed by Tzvi Piran, what uh, he suggests is actually the emission is not coming from this kind of reprocessing layer or from the accretion disk, but rather the emission comes from the creation of the, of the accretion disk. So basically when the streams are kind of uh, returning back uh, to the supermassive black hole, they intersect each other. And basically it's the emission from the shocks between the streams. It's called like sort of the Jerusalem bagel model. Um, so the emission is coming from there. And this would explain why we only kind of seeing like the 1% of the total energy that we would expect to see when a star of that mass is kind of getting accreted on the supermassive black hole. So uh, being said that, now you can realize like uh, there's quite a lot of uh, theory going on, but we don't have kind of enough observations at the moment to, um, to kind of distinguish between these models. So I would like to proceed and present the, the, the event, which is the topic of my talk. And this event, as you can see, was uh, discovered in this uh, search by IPTF. So you have the new reference, uh, the, yeah, the reference the subtracted image. And uh, one interesting thing is that this event was um, discovered in a um, galaxy with a, a massive, well, supermassive black hole, 10 to the 7, which is sort of the, the nominal one which has been observed for other optical uh, TDs. And uh, initially, some work suggested that TDs were enhanced in this kind of E plus A galaxies, which were like poor starburst galaxy, about like one giga year old, where it has a burst of star formation, and then it was sort of decaying, and maybe the stars were kind of scattered. But um, yeah, people in house, like, well, um, like, or uh, they uh, published a very nice work saying that um, rather than being an E plus A, what, what did matter was the bulge to total light ratio. So rather the density of stars in the core was sort of the sort of the more uh, important factor in increasing or enhancing the TD rates in galaxies rather than being like this kind of um, E plus A. So, um, yeah, being said that, this galaxy has a bulge to ratio of 0.5, and basically the suggestion is like the, run, the rate is enhancing like galaxies which have bulges uh, sort of larger than 0.5. Uh, so here you, you have the, the light curve, basically was detected very early on by the Palomar 48 inches. So here we have uh, gotten the event a bit on the rise. And then we started the follow up with the 60 inch and that, those are like uh, swift uh, data. So as you can see, sort of uh, the limit of our telescope is sort of here. So we kind of struggled a bit, but we made it. So yeah, we have a, a bit of a light curve for this event. And if you use the optical and the UV swift uh, data to actually compute the volumetric luminosity here in the top panel, you have a comparison, the blue dots of, for this event with other observed events in the optical from the assassin and like that one is the pan stars event. So an initial, you can see that um, our event this kind of a mediocre event is like kind of a really average and it does not distinguish from the bulk of the general optical population. A few months ago, we actually observed this IPTF 16 FNL, which was extremely low luminosity. And this is like a really an, an oddball uh, between these um, uh, tidal disruption events. So yeah, we can see that basically the, the decay time scales and the overall luminosity, if we compare these events with other observed uh, in the population, this was a clear outlier, but this 15 AF is like really representative of other events from like, Assassin and from Panstars. So for the um, enthusiasts in like radio and X-ray wavelengths, uh, we can say that um, there was no detection at all. Like we observed with, with SWIFT, you know, um, I'm sorry to disappoint, but there is no X-ray data for this event, like at all. Yeah, we stacked like nothing. Um, however, the, the radio, we observed it with a VLA and it was not, um, our observations basically are not uh, deep enough to rule some of the model. Let's say for this other event, highly low luminosity, we had like many, many VLA and some AMI observations, which actually um, uh, put into light that some TDEs may be even, even low, lower luminosity that, than this guy, which is as a C14 LI, which actually was like uh, shown that it has like very lumino low luminosity radio and was uh, also studied by uh, people in house. So um, this uh, IPTF 15 AF, basically, we, we observe it with VLA, but the redshift is much, it's, uh, it's much higher than, than this guy. So basically, we cannot rule out sort of kind of uh, low energy models, which are these like slightly fainter uh, curves and um, with uh, maybe higher density around the nucleus, which is the, the green line. So as long as we can discard it to be much lower luminosity than the SWIFT event, we cannot say much about, about radio. 
So if we go into, into the optical, I mentioned that for most of the events, we actually witnessed these helium-2 lines. And in the top panel, you can see the host subtracted spectrum of 16 FNL. And you can see that there is these two prominent helium-2 lines and the H-alpha lines, but there is a hint of helium-1. If we do the same exercise for this event, we also can see that the helium-2 line is there. It's very present, and also it changes uh, dramatically in shape. At the beginning, it's kind of very wide, and it kind of narrows down, and the same thing happens with H-alpha. And these, uh, these two epochs are a bit, um, yeah, they're, they're also, it's uh, kind of hard to, to distinguish. But yeah, the, the key of this event is that actually it had um, HST UV spectroscopy taken at uh, 75 days after peak. Um, so one of the noticeable things is that if we try to fit a black body temperature into this event, once we have the red and corrected for the Milky Way extinction, the temperature that we get for this event is much higher than derived from the SCD uh, using SWIFT and optical data. That temperature was around 40,000 Kelvin, and this is much closer to like 60,000. So then like a uh, very important thing is like trying to figure out why and there is this uh, discrepancy. And um, the next thing we can notice if we actually subtract um, the discontinuum is that this UV spectrum really resembles some of the quasars which display these uh, broad absorption lines. So we actually have some blue shifted absorption in carbon, silicon, and, and nitrogen, which is blue shifted about like 5,000 to 6,000 kilometers per second with a similar uh, full width half max. So um, in, in quasars, this has been suggested as outflows basically from, from the system which kind of absorbs uh, this emission. So we can say in, like, in the case of tidal disruption events, which also can be a bit confident to say that we, we see these like, really massive outflows as well, um, which are like, uh, taking part of the, of the radiation. And another point I would like to um, stress out is like many quasars display this magnesium two line, which actually we don't, uh, we don't see here. And uh, the final uh, diagnostic uh, for um, interpreting the spectrum is actually this nitrogen-3 to carbon-3 ratio. And uh, usually AGN display kind of very strong carbon-3 line. And maybe, uh, yeah, we can see it better if we compare uh, this uh, 15 AF. This is the ASASIS 14 LI and uh, IPTF 16 FNL, which are only three TDEs in the optical with the UV spectroscopy. And here in the bottom, you have a comparison with uh, nitrogen quasars and uh, composite SDSS. So yeah, we noticed that this carbon-3 line is kind of absent in all uh, three TDEs. And we do observe nitrogen, with, but we do not observe the carbon. And this has been suggested that basically maybe um, if we have a, an evolved star which has been running the CNO cycle for a bit, then we can uh, increase our uh, fraction of nitrogen and we depleted the carbon in the system. So yeah, what we can say straight away is that TDEs don't generally look like AGN. So basically, uh, we can be confident to say like this phenomenology is, is like very different. Uh, while we see broad nitrogen lines in TDEs, we kind of see narrow or, or even non-existent nitrogen in AGN. Uh, and as long as we see strong carbon-3 lines in AGN, we do not see them in TDEs. And the same happened like with the magnesium line. And the broad uh, lines, which are actually also shown in like most of these TDEs, are only present in like 10 to 15 percent of uh, the overall population of, of AGN. So um, they seem to be different. I mean, this is a work in progress, but um, yeah, we can really say that the, the processes behind it is kind of different. So there has been a very um, provocative question um, because of this nitrogen enhancement that uh, Chris Kochanek posed. And um, what he was saying is like, maybe these kind of TDEs, uh, when they kind of stop, uh, you know, making the flare, are actually nitrogen-rich uh, quasar. So is it, um, yeah, if we go to nitrogen quasar population, we, we know that it's kind of 1% of the all SDSS quasar population, and uh, they show extremely uh, strong nitrogen lines. And two different scenarios have been proposed uh, to explain this enhancement. One is that the overall metallicity of the gas which is being accreted is it's, it's much higher, uh, but uh, uh, much higher. Uh, uh, recent work uh, actually used other lines to study the overall metallicity. And what they say is that it's not the whole metallicity which is enhanced, it's just like the gas around the supermassive black hole is, is enhancing nitrogen only. So what they suggest is that actually they, um, oh sorry, 
A AGB stars, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, AGB stars are the one which is kind of evolving close to the supermassive black hole, and the winds are the ones which are like powering this burst of accretion onto the supermassive black hole. And uh, I mean, that seems to be also uh, a good theory because um, here you have a plot of uh, the black hole mass uh, cumulative distribution function for uh, the observed TD so far. And we can see that there are like two different models. One is the one that actually accounts that if you get too close to the supermassive black hole, you're going to be swallowed and you won't see any radiation. And the other one, the black curve, which is actually accounting that you will stop seeing TDs at very high masses. Um, so it seems that um, the reproduced, uh, uh, well, the, the observed fraction of TDs seem to be eventually truncated about like sort of higher masses for supermassive black hole. Uh, so could, could those be like an old, um, well, all these, all these TDs when they stop uh, producing flares, could they be this nitrogen rich quasar? Well, um, that again seems to be a bit unlikely because um, this work actually used 12 quasars and the masses that they studied, okay, it's a different redshift regime, but however the masses, as you can see, even they are like kind of lower than the general population of, of quasars in SCSS, they are still around 10 to the 9. And we actually would not expect any tidal disruption actually to be visible around 10 to the 9. But again, the numbers are small, so we need to increase our size. So here I would like to um, yeah, stress out that we need to increase our uh, size of tidal disruption events to actually say something about the, the statistics and well, you know, Fritz Wicke started looking for supernovae, um, you know, in this 18 inch uh, Schmidt telescope at Palomar. And, you know, uh, he was successful enough, like, you know, in uh, 52 years, he found 120 supernovae. So, um, you know, we kind of are going to take his own strategy at Palomar as well, but we are going to use the uh, 48 inch instead. Uh, with highly uh, innovative uh, instrumentation, uh, and we are expecting actually to increase our numbers from about uh, you know a few supernovae a year to 5,000 supernovae a year, and about like 15 uh, tidal disruption events. So um, this is not uh, only it. Uh, we're expecting like a huge stream of alerts coming every day, half a million of real astrophysical alerts coming from ZTF, which is being commissioning right, right now. So like right now they're taking the press release images for, for next week. So um, yeah, we need to actually classify things. And I would like to introduce this um, spectral energy distribution machine, which is like our lowest resolution instrument uh, mounted on the 1.5 meter, um, 60 inch uh, in Palomar. So basically it combines these uh, four filters in UGRI bands. And in the middle you have actually the, the IFU. So the, the, the goal of this is like it's fully robotic. We can program our supernovae or TDs or AGN, whatever we want to classify, and it's, uh, it's going to obtain the spectrum by point and shoot. It's 28 arc second field of view, so if your pointing is not extremely accurate, it doesn't matter. So there is a paper if you want to know more, and here you have like in black some examples of, of this um, SCDM spectrum. So, um, yeah, this, this instrument will allow us to identify these tidal disruption events coming from, from Zwicky. So, yeah, I would like just to uh, kind of wrap up saying that we have a, a few uh, campaigns ongoing. So we hope to obtain many more uh, UV spectroscopy for tidal disruption events from Zwicky. So we have a, a, an HST program for 70 orbits approved, uh, PI Bratchenko. And we also have a few proposals submitted to, to observe them in so many different wavelengths. So yes, I would like to conclude saying that like, TDEs is like an extremely exciting field. We have many compelling uh, theories to explain where the emission comes from, but we don't have enough uh, events. So it's a, it's a very fast uh, growing field and it's very exciting to be here. And it's even more exciting to know that actually we'll have many more of these events uh, be streamed like uh, in few months uh, to provide the first complete survey for TDEs. And yeah, big discoveries are to be made and it's very exciting. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, Respect to the tech, many killing over? E presumably. I mean, um, yeah, LIGO will be suspended for one year. Um, I mean, I think detections of kilonovi before gravitational waves has been claimed. 
And actually, if you put them in the same picture as the kilonova, they seem to kind of agree with the light curve that we've seen for this uh, last event. So I'm pretty confident that we will see kilonovi in the optical in the next uh, year. But of course, like without gravitational waves, it's more efficient to, uh, yeah, to define how they are. Um, yeah, the 15 TDEs per year sound, sounds low for ZTF. Uh, well, or this is like no widely problem. extrapolating. I mean, yeah. per, with IPTF, we found an average one or two per year. Right. So ZTF will cover 15 uh, times more area. So being conservative, then we just say like, yeah, like if you just multiply one by 15, you would say 15, and maybe 30. I mean, yeah, we, we don't know. It's like, it depends on how efficient we are with the follow-up. Isn't the sensitivity higher as well as the field of view? Uh, no, it, it's gonna go same depth, like 20.5, 21, or like, very nice. I missed this before, but why do you think the age of I think this was uh, addressed in a recent paper <coughs> from Nathan Roth, and what he was saying is like um, the electron density changes as the TD evolves, so the, the lines are kind of narrowing down. Um, Uh, I wouldn't say they got wider. I would say like the, yeah, the, maybe the host subtraction was not uh, really good because that was an SDSS spectrum which was really, um, yeah, really noisy. Yeah, so this is the 14 <laughs> Li at different epochs. Uh, and yeah, what he was suggesting is like, yeah, as you can see, there's like a narrowing of this, of this line. But yeah, maybe it's just like a noisy uh, host subtraction. We, we got a better spectrum now, so hopefully that will improve. So when you observe an event with this, the ZTF, how do you decide what, what's the key that it is a TDE? Not that, a yeah, that, that's a good question. We haven't been thinking about it. Um, so during the last year, we actually had a coordinated IPTF and SWIFT. Um, so basically, any time we saw a transient in the core, um, which displayed blue colors, because ZTF is going to survey the whole northern sky uh, in like two bands, GNR. And most of our TDs, uh, which have been found in the optical, they have extremely blue colors. Uh, so the flare is like G minus R, like uh, bluer than minus 0.5 or something like that. So we can just make a simpler uh, color cuts and position. And then um, with SWIFT, we can also detect whether the uh, TD has strong UV emission. And if that's the case, then we'll use our HST data to, to get more spectra. So during the TD event, um, presumably people have done um, hydro simulations to work out how the star is actually broken up. Do you actually expect more of the original stellar core to be captured, for example, than uh, the envelope, or does more of the envelope escape? Because that will feed into your, what you expect your abundance pattern if you have like a main right. star versus an evolved star. Is there any sort of abundance work you can do on the TD that mm. will tell you about the state of the star. In yeah, that I'm not <coughs> sure, and I'm I'm expert enough, but we have Morgan who actually did this uh, simulation, so I he maybe. I think if it's evolved, you strip out the envelope, and maybe the core survives even the encounter, and so maybe, uh, and as a function of time, the the material closest to the surface of the star will fall back first, and then deeper and deeper and deeper, and so maybe there is interesting composition that doesn't get mixed up too much. Thank you.